May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. What's your favourite Christmas carol? We were asking each other that when we were getting the church ready for the online service. I'm not sure I could answer that question myself, or at least that I'd be able to give you the same answer every time you asked me, except I do know which is my least favourite carol, which by happy chance is Anthony's most favourite of all. We're like Jack Spratt and Mrs Spratt, who are only at the fat, fat or the lean. He can sing it to his heart's content when I'm not here. How do you find out which carol people like best? You could try asking them, but I know a better way. When I was presenter in the cathedral at Christ Church, I would sometimes come down from my stall during a carol service and walk around listening to people sing. It would be half lit. They'd be engrossed in their candle and their service booklet. I could wander round in their midst unnoticed. Different carols came out very differently. Angels from the realms of glory would be tentative, restrained, as if they weren't sure. A little town of Bethlehem would be more, more confident, but not with much conviction. The one that always came out strongest, as if it was emerging from the foundations of the building. I wonder if you can guess. I bet you can't. It was, it came upon the midnight clear. There's nothing mysterious about that. It's to do with folk memory. Angels from the Realms of Glory only came into our hymn books in the 1950s. Our little town of Bethlehem only became popular when the tune we now know came out of copyright. Though the words had been available before that, so people knew the words, but they had to get used to a new tune. But it came upon a midnight clear, has been sung for as long as churches have held carol services. It's in our bones, that one, and it shows when we sing it. The verse I want to talk about, though, is one that we usually don't sing. It's a starred verse. It stands between you and your lunch. It's not going to cheer you up anyway. I tried to find a recording of it to play you, but people do not do it. There isn't one. And ye beneath life's crushing load, whose forms are bending low, who toil along the climbing way with painful steps and slow. Our parents and grandparents had a worse time of it in the first half of the 20th century than what we've been going through. Yet I think there's a sort of Murphy's Law at work Misery grows to fill the space available for it. So for us, it's been a blighted time as it was for them. And we're quite entitled to say we've had enough. It's time to move on. That's why we need to listen to the Old Testament lesson, the one from Isaiah about the wolf and the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. When Isaiah was writing, the whole nation had undergone a catastrophe. They were in enemy hands, hundreds of miles away from home, all of them. There was no realistic hope of any kind of recovery. And so they chose to put their hope in a trust that was quite unrealistic. The wolf and the lamb were never going to lie down together. A lion was never going to eat straw like an ox. But this vision would actually see them through. It was that strange vision of Isaiah that saw them through. 
What he was looking forward to, Isaiah, was a time of perfection, a time when all would be gathered in, all would work together in perfect harmony. It's the same vision that Christ presented to the rich young man. I obey the law. I do everything I ought to do, said the lawyer, but it doesn't seem to make life any better. How about trying to be perfect, says Jesus. Now that's not what it sounds like to us. Perfection in scripture means completeness, a state of peace and plenty. The Hebrew word is shalom, which is the same as peace as you know. Everything working together to ensure prosperity. That's what Christ means by perfection. Like the people of Isaiah's time, we're living in a time of chaos. We're living in a time of chaos, in a chaotic system. This is worth remembering. In a chaotic system, any input of energy, however benign, however well meant, any input of energy to a chaotic system is likely to end up giving an opposite result from what's intended. One person's actions and intentions deflect another's. A good deed done in a naughty world can actually make things worse. You don't want a long sermon for me today, so I'm not going to develop this. The story of creation in Scripture, the story of creation in Scripture in Genesis, is a parable of order brought out of chaos. Order from chaos. And that's the work God requires of us now. What we need to move the world forward, a world whose mood has changed over the last couple of years, a world which isn't really so pleasant to live in, a world where people are finding difficulties which did not exist before. What we need to move the world forward is what God gives us, simplicity single-mindedness, a vision of us and our neighbours moving forward into the future in step. It takes humility, patience, wisdom and maturity to take from the world the strain and stress that humanity is blithely inflicting on it, to stand in formation round the Christian values of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness gentleness, self-control, to eschew for the sake of our neighbours and the world, anger, envy, a quarrelsome spirit. God doesn't ask us for uniformity. He doesn't expect us to dampen down our adventurous spirit and rebellion against dullness and conformity. But he does ask us unashamedly to renew our hearts and minds and work together with God's good purposes as if we ourselves, as if we ourselves were the lion that's willing to eat straw with an ox or the leopard that will share its lair with a fatling, whatever a fatling may be. If this seems absurdly idealistic, if it seems too much to ask or too little. Imagine yourself standing by the cot of a newborn baby, a new member of your family. Ask yourself what you would be willing to do to smooth that baby's path in life. Give them a good chance. Well, today is the day and you're invited with every Christian who walks this earth to imagine yourself standing by a crib, the one in Bethlehem, to stand by that baby's cradle and ask what we would be willing to do to help reduce the chaos we live amongst, try to bring order to a battered world. The answer is right under our noses just within grasp of our hands, just as far as our feet will take us, just as many good words as we're willing to spare. Look now for glad and golden hours come swiftly on the wing. 
uh, rest beside the weary road and hear the angels sing. That's the second half of that dismal verse that I quoted at the beginning. Hear the angels sing. The angels are ascending over Salomstead and Nuffton Nervit tonight. They're ascending and descending. They come whether or not we invite them. They're already bringing to us the world we're hoping to live in. When peace shall over all the earth its ancient splendours fling. And the whole world give back the song which now the angels sing. May that be how things are for you this Christmas and always. I hope today and the rest of the week go well for you. <laughs>